Um, but we're particularly focusing on uh, this, this verse in Isaiah chapter 6, so it's part of two verses, and it says this, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people. And, and it goes on. And, and if you want to think about this passage, this passage can be summed up by these words. God in his holiness convicts you. God in his love cleanses you. God in his wisdom calls you. And God in his power sends you. I don't know. I find that a really helpful you know, uh, overview of this passage because you see that, don't you, in this passage? You know, God is in his holiness. He's on the throne. And when Isaiah is standing there, he's convicted by God's holiness. He said, how can I stand before God for I'm a sinner? But God in his love cleanses us. That coal is taken from the altar, the altar of sacrifice, a picture of Christ who would die on the cross for us. And, and that coal is taken in it and, and it's cleansed. And then God calls, says, who will go? And then God in his power sends us. Who are we to ever go and do God's work? But God gives us his power to send us. The church that I grew up in um, was a church called Bethel Church in Wixon, and some of you will know of it. Uh, and it's got a very interesting history because um, in uh, just after the end of the war, there was a, a man came out of Leicester with a tent and he set it up and he ran a mission. He ran a children's mission and he ran it for a number of weeks. And at the end of that period, there were some children and just a couple of adults who'd come to faith. And they got together <clears throat> and they decided uh, to start a church. And they heard of a shed that was for sale. And it was a 30 foot by 15 foot shed, you know, sort of um, two double garages put together. And uh, they went and bought this shed um, right from the other side of town and they got it and they rented a bit of land and they put this shed up. And there were eight members and they thought we, they needed a pastor. And they heard about a guy up in Leeds. And uh, this guy was married, he'd got some children and uh, they called him down and he preached in the little wooden shed on, you know, in Wigston in Leicester. And they made him a, a, an offer. I don't know what kind of offer you would be looking for if you were going to you know, leave secure employment and go out and serve the Lord. And they said this, they said, look, we can't afford to pay you. But by the door, there's an offering box. And, and people put money in the offering box and it wasn't a wealthy area at all. It's quite a poor area. And you know, people put money in that offering box to support the work of the church. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna screw another box next to that one. And anything that goes in the other box, you can have. Right. <laughs> oh, there's a choice. <laughs> Where do I put my penny? <laughs> and um, would you have gone? But Harry Sutton, he took that as God's calling. And he went. Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And God used him. God empowered him and, and built an amazing church that went on to plant many other churches. So as we look at this passage, I want us to think about and three things particularly. And the first thing I want us to notice is, it's God's work that God is speaking about. Because it says there, doesn't it? Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? God is speaking here. It's interesting, he uses the phrase uh, us, isn't it? God is speaking in the plural. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, the three in one. And he says, whom shall I send? It's God who sends. It's God's work. He's not blessing our endeavors, but we are serving in his. He's not backing our plans. 
but we are submitting to his plans. Do you get that? It's interesting, isn't it? I love what happened to Philip in Acts chapter 8. Do you remember what happened to Philip, Philip in Acts chapter 8? Philip's the evangelist, and he's in Samaria, and he's having the most fantastic mission. We, we just had a mission last week, and uh, when things are going right in mission, there's, it's absolutely fantastic. And, and Philip's in Samaria, and they're having this amazing, blessed time. Many people are coming to know the Lord, and the church is growing, and they're, they're evangelizing. And, and the more they evangelize, the more people come, and it's a great time. And God comes along to, to Philip and says, go to the desert. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you. When, when, you read, when you're reading through the Bible, do you ever think, I think there's little bits missing, you know, because I kind of think Philip would probably say, really? <laughs> you know, that place where all the sand is and nobody is? Yeah, you know, here we are, we're in the place with all the people and you want me to go to where there's no one. But Philip goes and he meets one man, doesn't he? The Ethiopian. <clears throat> who's coming back from Jerusalem confused. He's not understood it. And Philip goes and explains the gospel. And that man is converted. And what does he do? He takes the gospel to North Africa. And we know from history, there was an amazing revival in North Africa. And, and God knew exactly what he was doing. You see, if it was our ideas and our plans, we would have never gone to the desert, would we? Hmm. Aren't you glad it's God's work? Aren't you? I am. How would we ever get things right if it was our work? Who's the king and who's the servant? They're the questions we need to ask, aren't they? Because you see, the danger is sometimes we are saying, oh, Lord, would you bless our endeavors? Actually, we need to be seeking God's blessing in his endeavors. Do you get that's really important? When we live and work where it's our plans and we're asking God to bless us, we make ourselves the king and we make God our servant. But when we're doing his will, he's the king and we're the servant. And that is when we're truly conscious of what it is to be cleansed by the blood of the lamb. And then, and then, you know, here's, here's Isaiah, he's in the throne room. He's conscious of God's holiness. He's conscious of his sin. He's cleansed. And then he's conscious that he's putting God on the throne. He's making himself the servant. Peter puts it like this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. He says, he's just given a list of seven things to build into on the foundation of our faith. And he says, he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. What he's saying is this. If we're not living where God is on the throne and we are in the, a servant, the, the problem with that is we've forgotten what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we've lost sight of eternity. We're short-sighted and we've forgotten so easy isn't it i find it in my life don't you we lose sight of what it means to be cleansed we've forgotten the cross we've lost sight of eternity so can i ask you and i ask me who is on the throne in your work is it you or is it god never underestimate what god can do with one willing worker our motivation to serve is not the work, but our motivation is the cross and heaven, isn't it? And then the second thing we learn, so first of all, it's God's work. Secondly, it's a volunteer work. God doesn't force us to serve. Here am I. Send me. We're not forced to serve. And, and notice how quickly Isaiah volunteers. You know, God says, whom shall I send? He wasn't coerced to serve, but he was cleansed to serve. Do you see that? God doesn't, 
God doesn't sort of force us at that, but he cleanses us. And he wants us to understand that what he's done on the cross for us or what he's going to do for us in the future. I and mean, we should take those two things and say, God is holy. He's on the throne. He's cleansed me. Yes, here am I. Send me. When I was a young lad, I think it was about 10. And uh, my dad used to like cycling. And we went, uh, we used to go cycling around. One day we're cycling around. And dad said, we're going to call and see my friend, Mr. Haynes. He worked with Mr. Haynes. And we went around to his house. It was a really interesting man. He used to breed lots of goldfish or do you breed goldfish? Yes. Anyway, whatever you, you do with goldfish. Anyway, they multiplied in all these ponds. And uh, But the other thing he did was we went into his lounge and all on the lounge wall were crossbows. And he made his own crossbows. And I'd never met this guy before. And we sat there, you know, we're having a, I'm having a glass of orange juice. He sees me looking at his crossbow. So would you like a go? Oh, yes. So <clears throat> he gets one of his crossbows down. We go out into the back garden. He sets this target up and we're having a go with, you know, we're firing at this target. It's great. And he said to me, would you like one? Oh, yes. <laughs> he said, I'll make you one. I'll make you one specially scaled to your size. And, you know, many, many months passed. And then one day my dad came home. I I'd only met this guy once. He came home with this beautiful hand-carved walnut crossbow with an aluminium crossbow, that a yeah, bow that he'd made himself. And his wife had even stitched a quiver to keep all my arrows in. And he even made me a target with a tiger on. I mean, I'm probably politically incorrect to have <laughs> targets with tigers on now. But we had this big tar target with a tiger on. And um, that was amazing. How do you think I felt? I'd only met that guy once. I'd just started woodwork class at school. You know the first thing you ever make in woodwork? You know, it's not great, is it? Uh, I made a spice rack. It was actually, you know, three pieces of wood this way and two that way. And the joints weren't brilliant. But it was the best I could do. Do you know what I wanted to do with that? I gave it to Mr. Haynes. You know, this fantastic super craftsman who can hand carve crossbows and he gets my wonky spice rack to stick up in his kitchen where the joints have got lots of wax filling them and stuff like that I just wanted to respond by doing whatever I could for him because he had done so much for me do you get the point yeah you know, God isn't forcing us but he says to us look Look at what I've done for you. We are not forced to serve. But we should serve out of love. Because look at what he's done for us. Secondly, we don't serve because of the need. We serve because of the Lord. I think there's a big error sometimes in the church that we so often are portraying the need. And the need is urgent. And we should be aware of the need. But our main reason for serving is <clears throat> not because of the need, but because of the Lord, because it's his plan. When Isaiah a volunteered, he had no idea what God was asking him to do. He was not conscious of the need. He was just conscious that God was asking him, who will go for me? And Isaiah said, send me, Lord. He had no idea what he was signing up for. Just send me. When I was about 19, I think it was about 19, I had this guy in our church who's a missionary and he persuaded me and two others to go on a week's conference up in Kilcreggan, up in Scotland. And we had no idea what we're signing up for, actually. Um, but he was so persistent in persuading us, this amazing guy, Stan, Stan Leader, and uh, three of us drove up. I'd never been to a Christian conference in my life. And we went to this Christian conference and it was for young people. And I was just blown away by it and just shattered in many ways. I was a very shy and timid person at the time. Um, I felt unable to do anything publicly. And, you know, if they asked me to take the offering background at church, I said no. <laughs> you know, whoa. 
you know, used to get so shy, embarrassed and tongue-tied. But I was really impacted by what God had done for me. And at the end of that week, I prayed a prayer. And my prayer was this. Lord, whatever you ask me to do next, I'll say yes. Uh, and it was a very serious prayer for me. Um, and my guess was maybe it would involve taking the offering back or saying grace at the next youth supper. Or maybe top height, you know, this is my top worst, you know, expectation, reading the Bible in a church service. Whatever you ask me to do next, I will do. Three weeks passed, and Sue Paulsford, our youth leader, came along to me and said, the young people are taking a service at Enderby, this little mission hall. There's only four people who normally went there. It's a tiny little thing. So the young people are taking a service, and we would like you to preach. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, whatever you ask me to do, I'll say yes. And so I said yes. Uh, I know people who are there who still remember it. <laughs> yeah, they were just as shocked as I was. <laughs> um, but it, it was such a shocking event. They, even some people, some of the young people who weren't converted yet, uh, were running a, 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 a like a gambling you know thing on how whether you'd actually make it there and how long you would last. And actually, if you're interested, the sermon lasted six and a half minutes. And uh, there wasn't a gap, there wasn't a full stop. It just came out in one big, long sentence. It's about Samson. And, uh, but here am I, send me. Do I have any regret? I have to say it was, sweat was running down my legs. And uh, I didn't feel any better after I'd done it than when I was doing it, <laughs> you know, um, because I just felt, what I'd done was rubbish. But do I have any regrets? No, I don't. Because I knew that that was God's plan. Somehow God was going to use that. And I think some people were so shocked they actually listened to the sermon. It was just so <laughs> intense. You know, the, the tension in the whole room was so high at that point in time. It was incredible, really. We sign up. Not to a task, but to serve the Lord. Do you see that? We say, here am I. Send me. And here's the truth. Just like Isaiah, you will always make your best decisions before the Lord, conscious of his holiness and understanding the amazing grace of your own sins forgiven. You will always make your best decisions when you're in that place. We volunteer to serve the Lord. We trust him that he knows best. And we leave the what and the where and the how to him, don't we? Some of you might know a, an evangelist called Peter Anderson. He's gone to heaven now. Um, and that he traveled to lots of communist countries before the Iron Curtain collapsed. And uh, I knew him in his 70s and 80s. And I would ring him up to speak at our Young Life group or Glencroft Church or, or various places. And you know, you could ring him up anytime. And this guy's in his 80s. And uh, you'd say, uh, Peter, I wonder if you could speak at blah, 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 blah. Do you know what his reply was? Every single time. I just, he must have said this to me 30 or 40 times. If I'm free, I'll come. He never ever any hesitation. Oh, I don't know whether I've got too much on. He just took it that if we were asking, it was the Lord asking, and he trusted God in that way. Here am I, send me. There's an increasing trend in churches to have more and more paid workers, isn't there? Uh, there's one church in the Midlands. Um, it's a church of about 400 to 450 people on a Sunday. It has over 40 full-time workers. Right? I know some of us in our little churches are thinking, whoa. But it's really, in one sense, it's really sad. Because actually, 
They're having to take more and more people on because no one's volunteering to do the work. No one's saying, here am I, send me. In fact, I preached this sermon a couple, well, probably a month ago or so in another church. And um, at the end of it, one of the elders said to me, so I said, since COVID, he said, we used to have teas and coffees at the end of the service. He said, we'd love to do it, but no one will volunteer to do it. I thought that was quite interesting in the light of this. Uh, you know. um, what is it that God is asking you to do? Where could you serve? Have we got that view of, here am I, send me? Because somehow that's being lost in UK Christianity. It really is. And then thirdly, not only is it God's work, not only is it a volunteer work, but it's also a tough work. Look at what Isaiah has to do. It says, go and say to this people. By and large, God's work is tough. Those of you who have been around the block a few times in your Christian life, um, has God's work been easy? No. Has it been blessed? Yes. Have you been encouraged? Yes. But is it tough? Yes, it is tough, isn't it? And uh, it was for Isaiah. Look, look at what he says here. Verse nine, most people who did hear wouldn't understand. Uh, verse 10, people's hearts would be unresponsive. Verse 11, it was going to be a hard work for a long time. Verse 11, it was going to get worse and worse. Verse 13, but there would be a remnant. It was a tough work. That, you know, Isaiah was going to have to go and serve and serve and serve and serve where he was going to be. And it wasn't going to be <clears throat> some major revival. God is calling him to be faithful in a drought. And that's tough, isn't it? I remember going to Westwood Ho on beach missions. We don't go there anymore, which is it's probably a blessing, really. Uh, has anyone ever been to Westwood Ho on holiday? No, you, you, you're blessed, really. <laughs> um, it, it's one of these places, you know, when the tide's in, there is zero beach, which isn't the greatest place to do a beach fishing. Um, and, and when the tide's out, you cannot actually see the sea. And, you know, it just, it, I and a friend, we walked for an hour and we still couldn't see it when the tide was out. You know, so when the tide's out, all the holidaymakers you know, are like miles apart. You know, at the end of the meeting, we normally go and chat with people and we go and take our newspapers around. And uh, you'd finish your meeting and you'd, you know, there'd be a family sort of, you know, quarter of a mile over there. So you'd, you'd walk all the way over there and the whole beach is watching you do this. You get to this family who is in their little windbreak area. Would you like one of our newspapers? No. I, and the whole beach has seen this intro. I said, then you walk the next quarter of a mile to the next family. You know, this is just, um, it wasn't great. It's really tough. But Isaiah's work was tough. God doesn't call us to works. There are always going to be revivals. God calls us to be faithful. And I think we are in an age of small things. We're in an age where there are small returns, aren't there, for evangelism. It's hard. And the only question Isaiah asks wasn't encouraging either. Look at verse 11. Isaiah says, how long, O Lord? You know, how long am I going to need to do this for? And the Lord replies, until the cities lie waste without an inhabitant and houses without people and the land is desolate. <laughs> That's not encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I didn't ask any more questions. And in a way, I'm not surprised, you know. Because, um, well, you know, that's tough going. I, I, has any of you, have you ever read uh, the book Killing Fields, Living Fields? Anyone read that? Incredible book, isn't it? There's, it tells the story of the Cambodian church under the incredible persecution of the Khmer Rouge. It tells the terrible conditions 
of the refugee camps. Many people fled to the neighboring countries which the Cambodians uh, moved out to. And in there, it tells of a group uh, from an organization called YWAM. And they turned up at one of these refugees camps and the conditions in these refugee camps were absolutely awful. Many, many people were dying of dysentery. You know, there was just really tough times. And this group of young people, 18, 19, 20 year olds, they went to see the camp leader. I was gonna say commandant, but he wasn't the commandant. And they said, we would like you to give us the worst job in the camp. We just wanna serve Jesus. And he said, no, no, he said, you don't want this job. And he said, no, no, give us the worst job. He said, well, the worst job is this. We've got people with dysentery who are too, too weak to even clean themselves up. We need a team of people who would just come in daily and clean the people who are laying in their own mess and their own dysentery who can't get up. And you know, for many months, this group of young people turned up at the camp early and with an incredible cheerful heart and faithfulness, day after day, month after month, <gasps> They cleaned up people with dysentery and they did it for Jesus. And they shared the love of Christ and men trusted Jesus. That's incredible, isn't it? Here am I, send me. I remember a missionary visiting our church many years ago. And uh, I'm involved in some missions work, world mission. And uh, Turkey is a really tough country. And he described going around Turkey and he was traveling around Turkey and they're just trying to do a survey and they came to a little fishing town and there was, a, he got there and amazingly there was a church with 20 believers in this church. And he, he went to them and said, you know, which missionary organization started you? And they said, missionary organization, what are they? He said, well, how did this church start? And there was a young man from, the fishing town, he decided to join the Merchant Navy and he sailed the seven seas. And one day his ship docked in New York and he went for a walk, he couldn't speak English. And on a street corner, someone gave him a very nice booklet. It was so nice, he put it in his pocket. And uh, he didn't think any more of it. But then later on, he decided to better himself and he decided to start to learn English. So he got a correspondence course started learning English and he started hunting around the ship for anything that was written in English to practice his English on. And he found his shore clothes and found this booklet and it turned out it was a gospel booklet that told him about Jesus and how Jesus had died for him on the cross and how he could have his sins wiped clean and he be could become one of God's children. And this guy trusted Jesus. He got himself a Bible and he starts reading the Bible and then he starts thinking about his family and his friends back in his little fishing town. So he packed up the job in the Merchant Navy and he went back to his little fishing town and started telling people about Jesus. And they gathered and they became a little church. They only had the Bible, but they became a little church. It's amazing. I often think about the person on the street corner giving those leaflets out. I don't know if you've ever done that. It really is hard work giving leaflets out. And I always find, you know, if I get three rejections, asking a fourth person, I find really hard. You know, if you get people say, oh, thank you, thank you, you feel good. And, but just giving them out, it's tough. And I just wonder about that person. Maybe it was a lady and maybe she went back to her friends next day in the church and they said, how did your tracting go yesterday? Not too bad. Did you give many leaflets out? Well, not many. How many did you give out? And I'm not sure it was like this, but one. Oh, that's not many. Did you have a good conversation? No. Why not? Well, the guy couldn't speak English. Well, that's no good, is it? What good did that do? You spent all day on a street corner. And you only gave one booklet out and it was a guy who couldn't even speak English. What a useless day. But folks, you know, we have an amazing God. And we have a God who can take a booklet given out on a street corner in New York and who can start a church in Turkey. 
Is that great? Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. I was talking with Roger Carswell just over a week ago. The, he's an evangelist. And he was talking with Alec McTyre, or Tyr, um, the, who's gone to heaven. He was a, uh, a great Bible um, uh, expert, uh, probably the world's living expert at the time on the book of Isaiah. And he said to Roger, he said, you know, he said, I think there will be many, many more people in heaven than we ever dream of. And Roger said, why? They were talking about how hard it is evangelizing. And he said, well, he said, it's very simple, Roger. He said, it says in the Bible, God's word will not return to him void. So he said, the only way that can be true is if many people trust God in their last moments because they've already heard the gospel sometime in their life. How about you? Do you find that encouraging to keep going? Because we have a God who keeps his word and God says, my word will not return to me void. We do not serve because of results. We do not serve because we're being effective. We do not serve because we have the talents or the particular tasks or capabilities. We do not serve because we have certain gifts and abilities. We serve because God is holy. He is on the throne and we are his cleansed servants. Amen. Amen. We should say that, shouldn't we? We serve unconditionally because God knows best. We serve wholeheartedly because he loves us. We serve willingly because of who he is and what he's done. And we serve now because he asks us. And we serve with urgency because of eternity. It's God's work. It's a volunteer work. It's a tough work. But God in his holiness convicts us. God in his love cleanses us. God in his wisdom calls us. God in his power sends us. So what about you and me? are we those who are going to say oh my god is so holy he's cleansed me he loves me here am i send me let's close by singing a hymn it's 618 facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees <laughs>